Uh, Matthew chapter 19, please, sir, please, ma'am, all of you. Uh, Matthew 19, we'll begin with the text we uh, were in last week. We begin in verse 23. And it said, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who th But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, ye shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that have forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or fathers, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. I'll remind you that uh, the kingdom of heaven, that phrase that he uses there in verse 23, and in the kingdom of God, uh, that he uses in verse 24, are, are both synonymous uh, there, you can it, it interchange them either way. Basically, talking about the eternal realm, the place where God operates and functions, uh, where it even involves you and I, where He reigns and 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 controls our hearts. And so, last week we discussed uh, this text uh, to some extent. Uh, we we talked mainly a bit pertaining to verse 23 and 24 about the obstacles that riches or wealth, worldly uh, goods. Uh, can throw in front of a person and hinder our ability to walk with Jesus. So let me just briefly recap those four things that we talked about because I think it's a serious enough subject that it warrants being reminded once again. Number one, wealth can give us a false sense of security. Uh, when we do well and prosper in this life, which is a blessing from God, it's easy to develop an attitude of self-sufficiency uh, and uh, uh, that works against us depending upon God, the one who gave it to start with, okay? So we got to be very careful about uh, uh, finding our security in uh, our money or possessions. Number two, wealth can cause a person to become high-minded or prideful. Uh, it's in our nature, it's in the nature of all people to want to measure ourselves against those who are around us. And so if we prosper financially and we measure ourselves against those that are around us and we come out ahead, uh, it's very easy to begin to think, well, look what we've done and, and get high-minded and uh, think, uh, think pretty highly of ourselves, okay? And so there's a danger in that. The third thing we discussed is wealth can steal our time and energy and devotion. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Worldly treasures can be a drain on our life. Uh, they can require so much of us uh, as far as energy and, and thought and attention and devotion that if we're not careful, the first thing we know, we don't have time for the things of God, the things that are most important, the things that are eternal. And we don't give God what he deserves, but we actually give him what's left over. And he deserves far more than that. Okay? And then finally, last of all, uh, the fourth thing is wealth can draw a person into worldliness. We have to face the facts that money uh, tends to open doors in this life. And open doors lead us to begin to compromise our values, soften our convictions to the point that we can keep those doors open, or in an effort to keep those doors open, okay? And so uh, we've got to be careful about that, that we don't compromise uh, uh, our values and what God has taught us in his word in order to get ahead in life or to hang on to what we already have in life. It'd be better to lose what we've got and honor God than to keep what we've got and dishonor God. Okay, And so with all of that, um, in verse 23 and 24, uh, Jesus expresses how riches can easily block our way to salvation. Let's go ahead and read it again. It says, uh, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. 
So uh, he's just simply talking about, he's making a statement that it seems to declare that it's, it's impossible for a rich person to be saved, okay? And it sparks the same response from his disciples as it would spark from anybody who hears that phrase, uh, is, is that how, then how can anybody be saved? And that's exactly what they ask. In verse 25, when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, who can be saved? Now that word amazed would really line up more uh, with the, uh, the words we use today like astonished or bewildered or taken back. And really taken back is one that, that really fits the, the best here. They were just kind of taken back by what Jesus had said. They were like, how can this be the case that a rich man can and hardly enter to heaven that, that, that uh, was uh, it, uh, be easier for a uh, camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to go to heaven. They're just kind of taken back by that. And uh, uh, as I studied this, there are a number of different takes on the expression, um, a camel going through the eye of a needle. I'm not going to speculate because there's a, I don't think that's the most important thing. And I don't know enough about which take on it is correct. And so I'm not going to speculate on that. Uh, on the meaning of the metaphor other than we know that Jesus is obviously intimating the degree of difficulty that's involved with a person who has worldly riches surrendering to the Lord. We just saw that with the rich young ruler. You know, he had so much and Jesus kind of put him to the test there. He said, go sell everything you got, give to the poor and then come follow me. Well, we know that, that day he walked away sorrowful and he walked away lost. Uh, because he just wasn't willing to surrender, okay? And so this, this metaphor, if you will, of a camel going through the eye of a needle is Jesus uh, just, just really intimating how difficult it is for mankind who has all this worldly possession to surrender everything and follow him. And that it's very clear that that's his point, okay? But the disciples kind of have taken Jesus at face value on this, and they interpret it to mean that it just simply can't happen. Rich man can't be saved. And if that be the case, if the, if, 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 the narrow, if the gate be that narrow, their question is, then how can anybody be saved? And, uh, and uh, thankfully, Jesus relieves them of their concern in verse 26 when he says, but, or the, it says, but Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. So if it were up, what he's saying here is this, if it were up to the individual person to overcome his or her nature and surrender themselves to the Lord, then it would be impossible. If it were up to the man, uh, up to a man or a woman, okay, it would be possible. It couldn't be done. But he's saying with God all things are possible. There's a verse back in Jeremiah chapter 13. If you're in the same reading schedule as mine, you just read it the other day. Verse 23 says this, Can an Ethiopian change his skin or a leopard his spots? That's the question, okay, a rhetorical question. And it goes on to say, Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. What's he saying there? In other words, uh, a person's ability to overcome all the bad that's in their heart uh, is, is just as impossible as a black person changing his skin color. That's why Ethiopians were the black people, okay? And then it would be just as impossible uh, as, as a leopard making the spots go away. Go away. He just simply said it can't be done. It can't be done. Man can't change his own heart and what's going on on the inside. So essentially, this is what Jesus is saying in our text here. But he doesn't leave us with the bad news. He says, man, it, with, with man it's impossible. That's the bad news. You and I can't change our own heart. But Jesus follows up with the good news, and he says, with God it is possible. And he says that in the latter part of verse 26. So God can do it, uh, but man can't. God can do what man cannot do. Okay, salvation is a work of grace by a sovereign God. It begins with the Holy Spirit opening the heart and the mind of an individual, man or woman or child, and opening our heart and our mind to the reality, first of all, of our sins, 
uh, to see that, then to our need for salvation, and then further along uh, the recognition of God's answer or remedy to that problem, and which is, of course, we know the Lord Jesus Christ and his death upon the cross and, and uh, paying for our sins. And then comes repentance and faith. All of this is, a, is, is prompted, if you will. Though the, there's human will involved, okay? Don't misunderstand. We're not robots, okay? God doesn't program us. It, the, the human will is involved. But it's all prompted by the power of the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit moves in us, moves us to do those things, okay? The Bible says in John 6, 44, No man, Jesus said this, No man cometh to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. In other words, he's saying a man can't get saved unless God pricks his heart and draws him to salvation, okay? Now that verse, uh, 644, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. That verse goes right along with what Jesus says in verse 26. He says, with men is impossible, but with God all things are possible, okay? So six, verse 26 says, with men it's impossible. John 66 says, no man cometh to me. Verse 26 says, but with God things, all, are, all things are possible. And in John 64 says, the Father which has sent me will draw him. So these, those two verses overlap one another. Uh, no person, rich or poor, can overcome the, their sinful heart and turn to Jesus for salvation. But God will do it for them. God has the ability. And therefore it is possible. Verse 27 goes on to say, Then Peter, then answered Peter rather, and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Now, after hearing all of this, Peter, like anybody probably that heard these things, was probably a little bit concerned and probably wanted to have a little bit of assurance of where they stood, he and the other disciples. Uh, the, he, the rich young ruler had failed to surrender to Jesus for salvation, and he had forfeited the kingdom of God. Peter and his disciples have, uh, and by the way, uh, except for Judas, okay, Peter had no way of knowing right here at this point uh, what was in Judas's heart. He had no idea that he would... Uh, be uh, the one to betray Jesus, but he's, yeah, uh, Peter and the uh, other ten disciples had had left their jobs, they'd left their families, they, they had essentially been willing to walk away from their friends, they pretty much had forsaken all and had surrendered to the Lord, they denied themselves for Jesus' sake. So he's essentially saying, we've done all this, so where do we stand? Uh, in a sense of, 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 of the I'm assuming what he's meaning here in the kingdom. Where, where do we stand uh, after everything we've done? And, and uh, the, the disciples were, at this point, as you know, we're still following him along. They're still a little bit confused uh, concerning uh, Jesus and his mission here on earth. They're still getting a little mixed up about some of that. But there was no question they were all in. They were all in, okay. And, and, and so verse 28, Jesus answers Peter. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me, watch this, in the regeneration, I will talk about that in just a moment, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, he shall sit upon, excuse me, ye shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. The age that he's speaking of, that word generation, is something when all things are new, okay, making something new. He's talking about the kingdom, the millennial kingdom. Now, that's a whole different study in and of itself, but uh, uh, I'll just make a few comments about it. After the tribulation period, uh, when Jesus makes his return, and it, it, when his return is fully realized, okay, the partial part of it uh, is at the prior to the, the tribulation with the rapture. But when his complete and official return to the earth, all the way uh, to touch the soil, when that takes place, then he will establish his kingdom. It's be a thousand year reign here on earth, okay? Uh, righteousness is going to prevail. Peace is going to abound. Israel, God's people, will be restored fully 
as a nation, only this time it will be with full recognition that Jesus is the Messiah, okay? Their hearts are going to be right and pure about that. And the 12 disciples, of course, not Judas, but we know that if you read on in the book of Acts that Matthias is the one that replaced Judas, so there's a full 12. Uh, there's a dozen of them, okay? Uh, and uh, they're going to, according to what Jesus is saying here, and there's other places in the scripture that uh, 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 refer to this, is they're essentially going to sit on thrones, meaning that, and, and whether there's a literal throne or not, that's neither here nor there. He's essentially saying that you're going to have, uh, uh, you're going to rank under me, and you're going to be have leadership uh, or supervision or however you want to say it in that kingdom. They will rule to an extent. They'll be um, in, in uh, obviously in rank under him, okay, and uh, going to be able to oversee God's children. Now. That's not exclusive to them. Obviously, they have pretty elevated position because of what Jesus has said there. But also, all kingdom citizens uh, that, uh, that have served will be able to enjoy prosperity, healing, peace, fulfillment. It's not just for the Jews. It's for everybody, Jew and Gentile, that go into that, that are part of that kingdom. All born-again believers. In fact, verse 29 says, and every one that have forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands if I'm for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. He said everyone, okay, so Jew or Gentile, um, it makes no difference. There's going to be rewards in heaven uh, in this kingdom for everybody that has served and followed. Uh, if you do the minimum, the, the, uh, he says it's a hundredfold, a hundred times nothing is nothing. Okay, so don't do the minimum. Serve God a hundred times, a lot of service to God will be a lot of stuff, a lot of rewards in heaven, and that's the way that works, okay? Uh, and uh, and it, uh, we, there's nothing that you and I can forsake in this life that will go unrewarded in heaven a hundredfold. And, and that's a promise from the Lord here. So with that being said, we finish that, uh, we finish that text, and uh, we'll pick up in verse 30 the next time we come back together, okay? Appreciate you being here. We'll go ahead and stand and be dismissed in a word of prayer. Look forward to seeing you back here Sunday, and please, please, please plan, plan on being with us on Sunday night as well for the, uh, for the youth auction, okay? All right, good deal, good deal. Randy, uh, will you lead us in prayer, please?